first of all, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming out tonight to hear me speak. I, I wasn't too difficult. I've got a daughter, Caroline, who's a freshman here and loves it. And so when Cliff asked me to, to come down or if I had an interest in coming down, I said, you bet any chance I have to come down here, that's a good deal. So what I'm going to do um, this evening is I'm going to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time. And I, I'm going to ask for a little bit of interaction, but, but mainly try to get through this and then answer any questions you, you may have. Um, but let me kind of let it rip. So just before you know, talk more about investment philosophy, I want to kind of cover some fast facts with you. And I think, as I understand it, this group consists of people that are both interested in being entrepreneurs, business, investing, finance. And so we're going to touch on a little, little, little bit of all that um, this evening. So first, just kind of thinking about the entrepreneurial world, I want to give you some fast facts. Every day in America, 2,700 new companies are formed. Every day in America, 2,200 businesses fail. The probability of a new business surviving the first three years is 10%. In 2010, venture capitalists invested in 3,277 companies. In 2010, just 72 venture-backed companies went public. What kind of nut would start a business? So I'm going to ask you if you can name this nut. OK? You ready? See if he can, he failed in business in 32. He ran as a state legislator and lost in 32. He tried business again in 33 and failed again. His sweetheart died in 35. He had a nervous breakdown in 41. He was defeated for the nomination for Congress in 43, defeated again for Congress in 48, defeated when he ran for Senate in 55, and defeated for Vice Presidency of the United States in 56. He ran for Senate in 58 and lost. And the answer is, can you name that nut? Anybody? Abraham Lincoln. So I have a motto, because I think entrepreneurs are the types that take a bunch of uh, difficult problems and come up with solutions and aren't, aren't uh, deterred by obstacles. They overcome them. So this was a, something that Apple put out about 10 years ago, but I still think it is great. It says, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs, and the square holes, the ones that see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for status quo. You can praise them, disagree with them, quote them, disbelieve them, glorify them, or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. I'm going to go through, through a little bit of history of some of the people that uh, change some things. Thomas Edison, he's the one that came up with the expression, Success was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. Invented the phonograph, the stock ticker, t stock, stock uh, quote machine, as well as electric light bulb and thousands of other inventions. Also the founder of what became General Electric, and General Electric today has a market cap of $213 billion. Walt Disney, Walt Disney founded the Disney Company in the back of a real estate office in Los Angeles in 1923 after he was fired from his first job because he wasn't creative enough. Found that with his brother, the day the Magic Kingdom, $76 billion market cap. Sam Walton, uh, he started his first Walton Five and Dime store in Missouri and that one closed, it went broke. He started, he didn't, that didn't deter him, he opened up a second Walton Five and Dime store in New Jersey, this is what it looked like in Missouri, that one failed too. Ended up creating Walmart, largest retail in the world, $199 billion market value. Howard Schultz, uh, didn't found Starbucks, but he was the one that came out and saw this coffee company it was down at the Pikes Place in Seattle, if you know that area. He said, guys, he thought there was an opportunity to create coffee bars like you saw in Europe. People thought he was crazy, of course, Starbucks today, in basically every country in the world, largest coffee retailer, $25 billion market cap. Mike Bloomberg was fired from Salmon Brothers, uh, where he was a partner. He started uh, uh, Bloomberg, which is basically a, a stock quote machine business when he, when he started. Today, it's a global media business um, that is very, very successful. And obviously, Mike Bloomberg is the mayor of New York City as well. Steve Jobs, uh, the founder of Apple with Steve Wozniak, his goal in 1976 when he founded 
Apple was to have a computer that was insanely great. This is what an insanely great computer looked like in 1976. Basically, to fund Apple, they sold their, their uh, Volkswagen van and some other things to come up with the money to get it going. Today, Apple is the largest market cap technology company in the world, $310 billion. In my view, maybe the most important growth company in the world. And so you know, that's you know, kind of a quick historical snapshot of you know, some of these great entrepreneurs that had a dream and, and, and had different issues and obstacles, but they made something of it that became extremely important. But you know, the whole concept of you know, how do you determine where big companies come from? Well, typically big companies start as small companies. What I've done for nearly, uh, I think it's 16 years now, I've done studies to show um, that what the best performing companies in the market were, was and what were the characteristics that led to that outperformance. So in the last 10 year study, which was from 2000, December 31st, 2000 to just this last December 31st, um, studied over 10,000 companies and we came up with this list of the top performing stocks in all you know, the public markets. The number one performing out of, 20, uh, out of over 10,000 was Hanson Natural, the beverage drink, which is sort of a little bit surprising. You know, companies like Priceline and Deckers, which uh, make UGG, which, you, which you're familiar with. You know, Apple was number 10. Urban Outfitters, Joseph Franks were all on this list. Other companies like Sohu and F5, um, you know, Cliffs Natural, we made that list. What's interesting to me isn't so much who made the list, but it's how they got there. And so if you look at the stocks that made this, this list, um, on average, their performance was up 45% per year, which is really pretty remarkable, but maybe not so surprising to make the top 25 out of over 10,000 companies, right? But also, that was in the backdrop where the overall stock market was flat. It didn't have, you know, it basically had zero performance in that 10-year period, so that's that much more impressive. What's also interesting, um, the median P.E. price to earnings ratio for those 25 companies was 10 times. What I'll tell you is in the 16 years that I've done this study, that's the lowest P.E. by far of the studies. Usually the P.E.s are pretty high. In this particular study, they were, you know, 10 times is pretty cheap. The overall uh, average P.E. for the stock market over the last 70 years is about 14 times. So actually, this was very low these top performing companies. The reason for that is if you remember a little bit of history, the dot-com bubble burst in March of 2000 and the market was really kind of in a tailspin at this time. So you had companies that were actually selling at low PEs that uh, um, you know, ultimately had great performance. Oops, went ahead. What's interesting, just a second, I kind of blew a punchline. But what was, uh, what's always true is of those 25 companies, the average earnings growth per year was 39% per year. And so what led to you know, huge stock performance was a combination of a low PE and, and earnings growth of 39% per year on average. Another interesting fact was the median market cap of these 25 companies was $48 million, which is very, very small. So what my conclusion is, if we're trying to pick the companies that are going to be on this list, 10 years from now, we want to, one, focus on companies that have su superior earnings power, not necessarily the bargain basement. And second, focus on small cap emerging companies because as a company becomes larger, size forges an anchor. Peter Lynch, who's probably one of the top investors of all time, has this quote about earnings. He said, people may bet on the hourly wiggles in the market, but it's the earnings that waggle the wiggles long term. And that's definitely the philosophy that I have and what I think has worked well for a growth investor in terms of how you have superior performance. And this is just sort of an example of looking how earnings growth and stock performance over time are really highly correlated. So this is just Apple. What Apple, you know, over the last four years has had earnings growth of 54% per year, which is absolutely stunning for a company as large as Apple is. And not coincidentally, its stock has grown at 55% during that same period. Looking at Mercurial Libra, which is the eBay of South America, it's had 74% earnings, 74 earnings growth, and the stock has been a 70% um, appreciation 
uh, during the last four years. Looking at Baidu, uh, Baidu is a Google of China, 71% earnings growth, 92% stock growth. And, and the reverse is also true. Sun Power in the solar area had a 28% earnings decline on average, and its stock has declined by 29%. So that you know, one principle that if you can kind of take away tonight is that over time, a stock basically performs how the company performs. And so if a company's earnings growth is, is 30%, over time, basically its, its stock should appreciate 30%. If a company's earnings growth is 10%, its stock should appreciate r roughly 10% over a long period of time. In the short term, that's absolutely not true. In the long term, it's, it's, it's very much true. And so if you know what, what the goal that we see, well, let me just kind of go through some other facts. So this is just historic t returns by asset category. And so um, w bonds, you know, over the last 50 years, the average return for bonds is about 6%. Real estate is about 7%. Large cap stocks is about 9%. Small cap stocks is 12%. And venture capital is 18%. What's ironic, and what's, what's interesting if you look at how Wall Street works, 85% of Wall Street's research coverage is on companies with market caps above a billion dollars. 85% of NASDAQ is actually below a billion dollars. And going back to that study I just showed you, the top performing stocks for the last 25 years, the average market value of those companies at the beginning of the outperformance was very small, 48 million. So what that suggests to me as an opportunity is actually the, where you have the greatest potential for return is actually where the least amount of investors are looking, which is you know ironic, but nonetheless you know a great opportunity for people that want to do work and understand the principles of what makes stocks perform over a period of time. So. I want to just go through the next key thing I would like to have you guys take away from tonight. This is uh, Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein did a lot of amazing things, but one of his great quotes is he said that compound interest was the eighth wonder of the world. And I want to show why um, I think that statement is absolutely correct, and I want to show how that relates to the concept that we just talked about, how earnings growth over time drives stock price. So I'm going to play uh, a little... Do a little exercise with you, okay? So I'm going to ask you if we had, if I had a company and I was going to pay you as a consultant, and I was going to give you two choices, okay? Choice number one, I'd pay you ten thousand dollars a week, or choice number two, I'd pay you one penny the first day, and then we double that every day. So the second day you'd make two cents, the third day you'd make Four cents. The fifth day you'd make eight cents, right? Six day, sixteen cents. You guys tracking? So what would you take? The ten thousand dollars a week, or the penny and then doubling per month? No, come on. You take a penny. Thirty per month. We'll go. Well, let's, let's do it. So you want to do it? I thought you guys. I heard Westmount was a good school. They said to me. Well, let's show how this works. Okay. So, and I'm having a little trouble following what's going on, but we'll just kind of do this together. So, so basically, after five days, I said we're at 16 cents, right? Then we're at 32 cents. Then we're at 64 cents, right? Then what's that, 128? How many days are we at? Eight? What are so we got 1024 after how much? 11 days, 1024. You guys still want to do that? You still want to take the penny and double? Okay, we got 1024. So we're 2048 20, after how many? 12. Tori's going to make it easy. So it's 41 after how much? 82 after how much? Okay, we'll keep on going. What happens is by the 31st day, what, what do you think that works out to be? 
How much? It works out to $10.7 million. So, so just kind of hold that thought. That's, the, that's what doubling, the effect of doubling has. And going, we're going back to this kind of magic of compound interest. I'm going to teach you a, a little trick. How many people here know what the rule of 72 is? Is there anybody? If you do, you do? What's the rule of 72? Excuse me? Well, you, okay, you, you're, okay, here's how it works. So thank you for volunteering. Here's how it works. You take an interest rate and you divide it into 72, and that will tell you how, uh, how long it will take for that principal amount to double. So a 9% interest rate, 9 divided by 72 is what? 8, right? So if I had a dollar and I got a 9% interest rate, what the rule of 72 says that in 8 years, that dollar will be $2. Got it? So 12 goes into 72 how many times? So if I had a dollar in six years, it would be $2. That's what the rule of 72 says. So if you just kind of look at this real quickly, three, three goes into 72 how much? 24, right? OK, we won't worry about the value of the dollar. So it'll take 24 years to double. So 3%, if you could get 3% in a bank account today, you'd be happy. You can't. But that just sort of shows it takes 24 years to double. 6% takes 12 years to double. 9%, we talked about eight years to double. 12%, six years to double. 15%, 4.8 years to double. 25%, 2.9 years to double. 30%, 2.4 years to double. OK? And 50%, you're doubling basically every 1.4 years. So going back, if you remember that study that showed the top performing stocks of the last 10 years, do you remember what the earnings growth was for those companies? Its earnings growth for those companies was 39%, and the average stock appreciated 45% per year. So in other words, the earnings growth was doubling more than, you know, every, in less than two years. And the stock was doubling way faster than every two years. And that's how you get those amazing compounded returns for the stock, right? And so back to the point about how over time, earnings growth is highly correlated to the stock price. So if we're trying to get the greatest returns over, over a long period of time, what are we trying to do? Find the companies with the highest earnings growth, right? So if you're able to find a company that and you're highly confident and it grows its earnings at 35% a year, okay, its earnings will double approximately every two years, as will its stock price. So going back to that exercise, if I paid you to be a consultant, give you $10,000 a week or pay you the first day, it just shows you the power of that compounding over a period of time. Does that make sense? Tracking? Okay. So I want to show a little exercise of that, okay? So we're going, to, we're going to talk about the value of the Big Apple. So in 1626, Peter Minute bought Manhattan, the island of Manhattan, from the Wappinger Indians for $24. Okay? So he paid $24 for the entire island of Manhattan. So was that a good deal or a bad deal for the Indians or for Peter Minuit? Well, let's, just, let's look at it from the Wappinger Indian standpoint, OK? So what, that, what determines whether that was a good deal or a bad deal was what type of return you could assume they could have gotten on that money over the last 385 years. So if they were able to get a 5% return on that money, and going back to that slide that I showed you different asset categories and their return. So roughly what a bond yield has been, you know, a bond type of return. Okay? What do you think that 5% um, on $24 is over 385 years? About $3.3 billion. And so you say, well, that's a pretty good return. But when you, when you look and you see Rockefeller Center was sold... In one building in New York City, Rockefeller Center was sold for $1.9 billion in 2001. Maybe that wasn't such a great return if that's all they could get was a 5% return on their money. 
if they were able to get a 7.5% return, or kind of, you know, basically what real estate, oops, <laughs> real estate return, but that adds up to $27.6 trillion. And to give you an idea how big $27.6 trillion is, that's about half of the overall global stock market value. So that would be pretty good, you know, that, that they'd be pretty happy, the Wappinger Indians, if they would invest in real estate over the last 385 years, they'd, ha they'd own basically half the world's world value. So they'd be pretty, pretty good. What if they were able to get 10% or effectively the stock market return over the last 385 years? Anyone want to take a guess what 10% is? See, I don't even know how big that is, but it's a big, big, big number. That just shows what happens to compound interest over time. And obviously, you know, we're not going to benefit necessarily from a 385-year time horizon for investments, but it just shows you the power and the magic of compound interest over time. So, how do we find these kind of companies that have huge earnings growth potential? So what I've done is basically simplified. I think actually there's a couple of characteristics of great investors. One, they make very complex things very simple, and they're systematic in terms of the way they operate. So there's a framework that they apply as they look at different investment opportunities. And so the framework that I've developed, I call the four Ps, which is very simple but I think it's, a, it's exactly the characteristics that you look for in companies that can have outstanding earnings growth um, in a, for a long period of time. So the first, you know, so I say, how do you create an unfair advantage? So this is one look at an unfair advantage. But investing, what it really boils down to is understanding um, companies will have what I call the four Ps. The first P is people. And as, as trite and as simplistic as that might sound, whether you're talking about company or you're talking about a sports team or you're talking about a country, it's leadership and people that make the difference in terms of overall success. What I found is that winners find a way to win and losers unfortunately will find a way to lose. And so the, the, the reality is, you know, the, the, the magic behind any great growth idea starts with the people, the management team, the culture. Here's just an example in sports how one person can make a difference. So Michael Jordan when he joined the National Basketball Association in 1984 out of North Carolina, Chicago Bulls were the worst team in professional basketball. That's how they got an opportunity to draft Michael Jordan. So in that year, they were able, they charged $15 a ticket, and they sold a grand total of 261,000 tickets that year. If you look over the Jordan era where they won four world championships, they were able to take ticket prices, double them to $30, and they're able to triple effectively the overall attendance. And this doesn't count TV rights and merchandise and all this. So basically, you add it up, one person made about an $18 million difference just through that addition to the Chicago Bulls. If you look at um, in companies, this is a picture of, uh, of Google and some of the innovation that goes on. Fortune magazine every year comes up with a study showing the best companies to work for in America. And they look at a bunch of different attributes. But if you really, and I actually think it's pretty useful just to look at, um, you know, what organizations really take the human capital, look at the how, how important people are to an organization. And what you found, basically, is companies that make this list. I'm sorry, I'm pushing this thing as delayed. Get one more shot, otherwise it's going to make the point move on. It's going to make the point move on. Companies that are on that list are companies like Google, Goldman Sachs, Cisco. And what's interesting is you look at how those companies perform in the market. This slide doesn't really show it as well. You know, those ten, the top ten companies and the best companies to work for returned of 40% um, in the last five years, where the S&P return was negative 7.1%. The second P in the four Ps is product. Here we're looking for a company that leads its industry as a proprietary product, one of a kind type of company, something that makes it special, different, or great. And what we ultimately want to do is find a company not, that's not the number two or three, but really the leader, because particularly when you look at network business models and internet, the leaders get the, por the, the leaders in the industry have a disproportionate advantage. And so companies that truly are the best. The third P is potential. And here we're looking for companies that enjoy megatrends. 
which really are the tailwinds at the back of an industry that supports that growth that we're looking for. And so what I like to think about is what are the growth sectors of the economy, so technology, healthcare, alternative energy, uh, media education, business and consumer services, and thinking about these powerful mega trends intersecting those growth sectors because that's, of course, where you've got a you know, tremendous amount of tailwinds that creates these opportunities for super superior growth. So one mega trend is the knowledge economy. In a global marketplace, knowledge-based economy, you know, knowledge businesses, learning businesses are the businesses that um, have superior potential. It's really in today's world, it's intellectual capital, not physical capital. That is what makes um, businesses great. Globalization is not a new trend, but looking at that as a mega trend. Today, of the S&P 500, over 55% of the earnings come from outside the United States. If you look back 15 years ago, it was less than 10%. That's a huge trend. The internet, you know, which is basically transforming every industry, both traditional and new industries. Consolidation, looking at mergers and acquisitions. What you also find is there's many fragmented industries out there that consolidation uh, supports um, additional growth. Branding, demographics, I'll talk a little bit, little bit more about in a second. Outsourcing, convergence, those are all the mega trends that I've traditionally looked at um, and how they cross-sect these growth sectors. I've added a few new mega trends. One is sustainability. It's no longer a question of growth or green. You've got to do both, and that's for all businesses. Free, again, there's been free business models for a long time, but this whole free and freemium business model structure has been something that really um, has, has, has took, took um, a lot, kind of life of its own and, and I think very important. Open source is another mega trend uh, impacting many industries. And so, um, and then digital natives, which you all are digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. But it's how you know, digital natives really are transforming the marketplace and the world that we're in. And the fourth P is predictability. And what that really is, is the visibility of that growth. So what you're looking for is companies that have you know, great people, leading product, huge potential, but then also pre predictability um, that gives you confidence in terms of what that, of what that future um, business is going to look like. So one of my uh, great, my, my favorite uh, economist, a guy named George Carlin, you probably don't know him. He's, he wasn't really an economist, he was a comedian, but he said, for, you know, forecast for tonight is dark. That's perfect predictability. So we're looking for companies that have that kind of predictability. Um, and if we find those four Ps, we get really excited um, in terms of a business opportunity. What, what's critical to, to understand, and, and we looked at companies that you know, performed really well over the last 10 years. We looked at some examples of, of great entrepreneurs and the success that they had. We thought about the four Ps, but the one thing that I think is really important to understand is the one thing that's, that's constant is change. And so, you know, and, and this is just a, a, a study looking at the top largest market cap companies in the U.S. capital markets, U.S. stock market in 1925. What you find is that 37 of those hundred were in railroads, metals and mining, and automobiles. Because automobiles, of course, you know, 1925, that was a big growth industry. In information technology, financial services, and healthcare, zero of the largest 100 companies in America were in those industries. If you look at today, while the, uh, you basically have uh, nine companies in the, in, the, in the three top categories, which by the way is higher than it's ever been, it's been the last 15 years, it's still substantially below what it was um, back in 1925, but now in information technology, financial services, and health, in healthcare you have roughly 50% of the companies um, in those three industries. Looking at um, just some c quick context in terms of the markets, um, everybody who pays any attention at all recognizes that uh, you know we've gone through some extraordinary uh, difficult period over the last several years. In 2008, the Nasdaq was off 41.5 percent, the S&P was off 37.6 percent, the Dow was off 33.8 percent. 2009, substantial rebound. And then 2010 was a nice follow-through, um, you know, in terms of 
um, the performance off of the 2009, what I call almost dead cat bounce from 2010. And 2011 has started out um, in, in, in pretty decent fashion as well. Looking globally, because increasingly, you know, we are in a global marketplace. They were hit even worse in 2008 when you had the financial crisis. You can see that you know, Brazil was off roughly what the NASDAQ was. China, you know, off 64.9%. India off 54.4%. Then again, in 2009, even more spectacular rebound. In 2010, with the exception of China, again, uh, pretty decent you know, follow through in terms of the overall performance. In the IPO market, and one thing that's that uh, you know, for somebody that's interested in innovation and emergent growth and where do you find these stars of tomorrow, you know, the IPO market's been a pretty important hunting ground historically because that's where new companies come to market, companies that are doing something different, some, something that uh, makes them want to access public capital. And if you look at just what's happened here, um, it's actually a, a little bit of a problem. So in the 1990s, on average, you had 533 IPOs per year. And the average market value of those companies was about $130 million. 51% of those companies were VC-backed. So if you go back to that um, diagram or the, some, of the, some of what I, I talked about at the beginning, um, so 51% of the IPOs during the, the 1990s were VC-backed. You have roughly 260 VC-backed companies going public a year. You might recall when I talked initially, we had roughly 70 VC-backed VC companies went public last year. So about, you know, it's actually off 85% in terms of VC-backed companies going public. You know, you look at the, you know, the, the frequency, um, you know, you've had IPOs overall down 75%. And the characteristics of these companies are much larger. So the average company that's going public is 911 million, which is about 20 times larger than that study that I showed the top performing stocks came from the last 10 years, and seven times larger than the average IPO um, 10 years prior. And just as I said before, a small fraction of the companies have gone public or VC back. So that's just, um, it, it, it makes it more difficult as entrepreneurs being entrepreneurs are doing things to create solutions and create an access to these type of companies. But um, it does point out that if you're trying to find these companies that we described in, it just becomes a little bit more challenging than just looking at the IPO market. And I, I got a great quote from Warren Buffett, since 19, 1776 it's never paid to bet against America. And I think that's true and that's my point about the entrepreneurs coming up with innovative solutions to to addressing some of these issues that have gone up the capital markets. Other positive fact, as we look at the market for investors, you know, going back to my point before, you can see the, 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 the average PE for um, the market is 14 times, but for growth companies it's 16 times. It only makes sense that the PE multiple that investors would naturally pay for companies that have the highest earnings growth should be significantly higher, but it's only, um, it's, only, you know, it's only 16 times versus 14 times for the overall market. So it's a great time to be a growth investor overall because you know, PE levels, evaluations really are, are pretty attractive. So, you know, if we're in a new bull market, and I really haven't made the case for why we're in a bull market, but I just wanted to point out some different facts, what lead into some trends. Um, but if, if we're in a marketplace that I think supports investors to make money investing in the market, you know, who will be the leaders? Because ultimately, where the greatest performance comes from is, you know, from the companies that truly are leading the market. So the Amazons, the Googles, the Intels, you know, the Oracles, and, when, you know, the Microsofts. So what, um, and I'd argue, kind of going back to the, the point about where you're going to find the, 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 the companies that are going to appear on this list 10 years from now, I say as age is to an athlete, the size is to a company. And so just like it's unlikely that as much as Brett Favre has had a Hall of Fame football career, um, he's retiring now. But if, if he wasn't, you know, his next 10 years would probably not be as good as the last 10 years. You know, it, it, and that's just sort of the, the concept. As a company gets large, it just becomes that much difficult to have that super earnings growth that was what contributed to the, to the, to the you know, top performance. And so um, 
as we talk about new, new eras need new leaders, what I'm going to conclude with is just talking about some of the investment themes where I think um, you know, the, the greatest opportunities are going to be found. So the first theme is this digital natives versus dim digital immigrants and, and looking at some statistics. Today, uh, I'm sure every single one of you are on Facebook and you are amongst another you know, 650 million people in the world. You know, if it were a country, if Facebook were a country, it would be the third largest country in the world. It was mentioned that I was on John McCain's uh, National Finance Committee. In February of 2008, John McCain raised $11 million doing kind of traditional campaigning, going around with his hat in hand and asking people for money. In that same month, uh, President Obama attended no campaigns, but he raised $55 million through Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, etc. The family structure, when I was growing up, this is what it looked like, kind of dad at the top of the hierarchy, mom and the kids. Today, it's basically kids in the center, surrounded by parents, surrounded by grandparents. And this is, in just looking at the change that's going on, is pretty striking. You know, looking at how media is consumed, for example, reading newspapers, generation, uh, the baby boomers, boomers spend four hours a week reading newspapers. Uh, generation Y is one hour a week. Watching TV, Baby boomers, 14 hours. Uh, Generation Y, 10 hours. Playing video games. Generation Y, four times greater. Using cell phones, three times greater. Using the internet, 70% greater. More videos have been uploaded on YouTube in the t last two months than new content that ABC, NBC, and CBS have been airing since 1948. YouTube streams, streams more than 2 billion videos a day. More people watch Hulu uh, than Time Warner Cable. And looking at digital books, you know, right now digital books are almost 40% of all books sold are now digital, and that, that, that's accelerating. The iPod, obviously, or the iPad is, is disrupted um, in a whole marketplace and is going to continue to do that. And the digital textbooks, which are just in its infancy, is coming very fast, which I think probably everybody in this room will be delighted about. Twitter is exploding, 200 million users worldwide. And while traditional media, newspapers, you know, it's, it's falling off a cliff. I mean, the way that people are consuming media is changing dramatically. Look at people being married last, last year. One of, one of eight people that were married uh, met online, which maybe doesn't mean that shocking to people in this room, but it's shocking to me. Some of the most powerful business models that are being created, and as I think, as you think about whether you're looking to start a business or whether you're looking to invest in a business, is where they have network effects. And what network effects are is basically the law that shows that when you add a user to a network, it's the, the growth, of the, the value of the growth of that one additional user is not linear, but is exponential. So a fax machine is a great example of a network effect. If there's one fax machine in the world, it's not very valuable, but when you have a second person, it becomes a little bit more valuable. When you have a third person, it, add, it grows not by just adding that one person, but it actually grows more than that. And so these business models like Facebook um, you know, you know, and, and Twitter, and Skype, and YouTube, and the iPhone with the apps. I mean, these are extraordinarily powerful business models. I mean, as you think about businesses that you're either involved in or want to invest in, thinking about how you can create network effects, I think, is a very important um, idea. Free economics. You know, the, the idea of free, um, I mentioned before, I think, is increasingly important. Giving things for free is not new guy named King Gillette. You ever heard of Gillette Razor? So about 100 years ago, King Gillette said, you know, he'd give away the razor to sell the razor blade over and over and over again. And so that was, but these, the, the, the kind of the free economics or these free models um, have, have really taken a life of its own. One of my favorite examples of these free models is Ryanair. So have you ever, who's heard of Ryanair in the room? So they're a very innovative airline. 
um, which is a little bit of an oxymoron. But they basically are trying to figure out ways to make it so it's free for you to fly, but they make money off of all the other things that they provide for you, whether it's hotel rooms or whether it's the, the, the rent-a-car or the things that you can consume on the flight. And so it's really, you know, if you can think about a traditional airline, how do you compete against Ryanair? Well, it's very, very difficult. Um, another key theme, the phone is my life. You know, for my parents, their automobile is basically how they identify themselves. For my daughter, it's her phone. And the phone is the, the way that she communicates. The phone is how she, she organizes herself. The phone is a computer. And if you look at the, the impact that the iPhones had, they've had 90 million iPhones sold since its launch in 2007. Absolutely striking. You look at the apps, if you pay attention, now how many people here are app Apple consumers? So if you go there, well, yeah, it's amazing. So the Apple, the Apple App Store just sold its 10, 10 billionth app last week, which is a huge milestone. Yeah. If you look at this, interesting, 93% you know, of all U.S. adults have a cell phone, but a third don't feel safe using it for payments. But how fast this is changing, if you, you know, PayPal, which is a leader in internet payments, has mobile payments as well. Their mobile payments grew 300% during Christmas this year from last year. And if you look at your generation and younger, you know, the average, you know, average uh, teenager sent 2,200 texts per month, which is amazing. Another, um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble keeping these slides on. Get back here. Maybe it won't. Okay. I'll tell you about women, you know, the power of women. I mean, what, what's happened is pretty dramatic. What's happened is pretty dramatic. You can see examples of successful women in every aspect of society, whether it's politics, whether it's business, uh, whether it's sports. And in terms of what is going on in society, it's pretty substantial. So for example, if you look at in college today, when I went to when I went to college, about fifty five percent of the students were male, forty five percent were female, obviously that's probably half of it. Um, today that's more than reversed. About fifty eight percent of the students are female, forty two percent are male, and the same kind of statistics hold true in graduate school. Um, because there's absolutely uh, substantial evidence that shows how one, you know, one's education level tied to uh, their, their uh, salaries in, in life, and that has pretty profound impact. When you look at businesses that are being started today, women are starting businesses at a two to one ratio to men, which is pretty, pretty interesting, and, and just a bunch of other things that I think are critical to know. Um, education and the knowledge economy is a huge, huge trend and theme to understand. You know, back to that pay gap, the pay gap between somebody who has a high school education and a college education is about 100% today, and it's growing. And effectively, uh, what's happened is education has become the civil rights issue of today. U.S. education, um, you're basically looking at the online market, you know, which the Internet is democratized learning, increasing access, lowering the cost, and I think ultimately will improve the quality. So in 1995, 0% of all students were online. 2000, by 2002, 10% were online. Today, about 25% are online. And that will be, um, you know, that's going up to nearly 100% in the next seven years. Not 100% totally, but 100% some part of your class will be online. Top 10 on-demand jobs did not exist in 2004. And social learning, the whole idea of learning by doing and sharing peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, that's a huge um, area of, of growth and opportunity. The teacher is a rock star. There's a company in Korea called Megastudy where their, average, where their top teachers made $2 million last year. And the whole idea is that the top teachers are basically able to interact and, 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 more, and uh, be accessed by students that were trying to, to learn from their subject area. And just the one last point on education. This is what I call the future look. Have a platform like an iPhone with social communication app application like Facebook, have an adaptive technology like an Amazon, the entertainment value of Disney, and that's what I believe tomorrow's education looks like.
sustainability, um, another huge area for opportunity. Uh, this just looks at the shift that's going on in the world. We're currently about 15% of the world has quote unquote American type of lifestyle, you know, versus 85% um, obviously that don't. By 2050, that's going to be 43%. Um, and, and, and that's going to be uh, hugely taxing on energy um, needs for the world that we're in. Now, the good news is entrepreneurs and technologies come to the rescue. You're starting to see Moore's Law applied to grid parity. So this just looks at the cost of solar versus oil and electricity. And you basically are reaching that, in, that crossover point by 2015. You've got innovative technologies and batteries for cars. You know, companies like Tesla and Fisker and Better Place coming out with new models to transport people. And the last theme I'm talking about is water. Um, you know, again, I think some of the greatest investment opportunities where there's a problem and, and companies that offer solutions to those problems are well rewarded. You know, I think it's probably slightly uh, hard for somebody in, in, you know, in our country to think, you know, how big a problem could fresh water really be? But of the seven billion people in the, United, in, in the world, approximately two billion of those have issues with getting access to fresh water. And so you look at uh, what I call blue tech, everything from water intelligence, water IT expected to grow 41% through 2020, desalination, not a new technology, basically taking the salt out of the water to, to be able to uh, make it uh, consumable, uh, growing 15% a year, recycling is another uh, area that's growing at um, substantial rate. And so, you know, just in closing and, and open up the, the questions, I know I covered an awful lot in a short period of time. I'm sorry I was getting a little bit caught up in the slides, but hopefully you were able to track most of it. And so if I were to kind of leave with a parting comment before I take it open to questions, it's one, you know, just remember you know, that it's, if you focus on uh, identifying great companies, and the characteristics which make a great company. And then you're able to take advantage of that uh, earnings growth over a period of time and the magic of compound interest. You can have tremendous, tremendous investment returns. So with that, I'd love to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.